I'll start with a with a um, presentation. Oops, so that's the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> and so I think now you see see it. Yeah. Um, what we want to tell you about this um, about today is um, about harm, harmful algae blooms. Uh, threat in drinking water works and uh, BBE products application in this field. Um, Detlef Lose is um, uh, my colleague and um, Tobias um, my, my, myself will make this presentation. Also, um, please sign, uh, I'm already told uh, um, uh, Babak that you have questions, please write it in the chat and then we will um, follow up later on with these uh, questions. Um, the agenda, um, we uh, start with reviewing the algae bloom and its threats, then um, we uh, have a little bit aspect of algae treatment methods and uh, the main question we have in uh, cyanobacteria and that's the main uh, problem in waterworks yeah, and about online measurement and uh, at different treatment steps and question and open discussion later on. And also please open discussion also if you have um, um, some other topics, not only question, please let us know about what you are um, doing there. Yeah, <clears throat> good morning out to all of you from my side. Um, I will start here to tell you something about uh, algae blooms and uh, we have to distinguish algae blooms and so-called harmful algae blooms. So that means algae blooms can happen every year in the springtime when we have bright sunlight coming up and we have uh, the growth of algae. But beside of this we have also harmful algae blooms because they can produce toxins. So these small, microscopic small organisms, they produce inside metabolites, which are toxic to human, to cattle, to everyone, uh, also to some water organisms. So when they bloom, this means that they become very dense. You can see this here on the left side. Uh, it was in uh, late uh, winter time. Uh, it's uh, strange, but uh, it uh, tends to become more and more. And then this displays other algae, and uh, if this grow too much, then they will die. They consume all the nutrients and they will die, and then consume also the oxygen, and it becomes dead zones. And this is a reason why uh, this uh, water is uh, threatened by this growth of harmful algae. And with this also, we have the release of taste and order compounds, which they also produce, and they this smells and tastes not horrible. So what you can see here is a typical uh, blue-green algae. This is uh, something what we call close to the bacteria, but they are photosynthetic organisms. The microcystis, uh, we come back later to this, but they are very common here in Europe, but all over the world. So in the next slide, I can tell you something about uh, the upcoming blooms and what we see here is uh, Lake Erie in US America. It is the largest uh, freshwater reservoir. And on the left side, this, is, this picture is from 2014, you can see there is an upcoming bloom. This is the green color from, from you can see it from satellite. And you can see that these uh, blooms are spreading, spreading much more and more. And you will find them mainly in fresh water. Uh, but you can see also that they come up in marine water. We have other algae which um, which are very common in marine water, but sometimes or more and more you find them also in marine water, these cyanobacteria. So for example, at the coast of um, Florida, we have now measuring stations where they survey, survey the upcoming cyanobacteria blooms. So in the next slide, uh, I can tell you two other places. What you see here uh, is uh, uh, first it is India. Uh, it's uh, the frequency of occurrences of algae blooms. And what you can see, there is an uh, upcoming number of algae blooms with the years. Um, this is from India. The other part is again US America. This is a forecast. It was for 2022. It's not complete, but what you can see also rising a frequency of blooms 
in this freshwater. And of course, this freshwater reservoirs, they serve uh, for drinking water production, as around this uh, lake area, they have numbers of waterworks located. So that's it for this. And uh, we now look for the different algae blooms that we experience. I made this um, uh, estimation about uh, algae blooms uh, from different literatures. And what you can see that algae blooms, they come up from cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria, that is the, the blue color. We have these dinoflagellates as another form of uh, microalgae, which are in the marine zones. And we have the diatoms, which are uh, a typical spring um, um, phytoplankton. Um, diatoms uh, are rarely uh, toxic, but the cyanobacteria and the diatoms, they both they can produce those harmful toxins. And as these are really toxins, uh, the World Health Organization, they made an estimation how much of these algae are allowed to serve uh, or to use this water as drinking water, or let's say for recreational purposes as bathing waters. But here we focus on drinking water and what you can see, they made an estimation of the chlorophyll content because the chlorophyll content is much more easier to check than the content of biotoxins. But usually, as we know, biotoxins, they accompany uh, the upcoming occurrence of algae. The cyanobacteria chlorophyll content could be a good, uh, way, a good way to check if there is a, a threat for the drinking water. And can you please switch up? Can you please switch off your microphone if you are not speaking? And so the World Health Organization, they made a guideline uh, how much of this um, toxic uh, should, could be accepted inside of the drinking water. So this is only a guideline and this is not fixed, but what we know is that the different countries, they have uh, different thresholds. So this is what you can see. But uh, here we focus on something which we can measure directly. So we look for the chlorophyll content, which may serve as an equivalent for the biotoxin. Okay. And in the next slide, you may ask uh, what uh, might be the reason for this upcoming threats by cyanobacteria, or we call it also the blue-green algae. Yeah, that uh, the cyanobacteria is the same uh, name for the blue greens and and we have here the reason quite clear the high number or amounts of fertilizers that are used today they use um, um, nitrogen and phosphate and uh, phosphate is a very good for the growth of cyanobacteria and as uh, the uh, fertilizers are washed out from from the fields into the water come into the lakes and the rivers and allows the, the blue-green algae to proliferate. Then we have another point, important factor, this is the bright sunlight. When the sun comes up uh, in uh, summertime, it gets warmer, then they uh, like it very much at the surface, to stay at the surface and uh, to use this uh, light for photosynthesis and for their growth. And also the increased temperature may be also caused by the global warming change will help them to grow much better. So that is uh, that are some reasons uh, why they can be so uh, positive in their growth. And we have of course uh, some consequences and I have a short list here, what they can do harmful things. Uh, one thing which is really important thing that is the most noted um, uh, disease is the irreversible hepatotoxicity. That means the liver is affected and uh, it is known that they have also tumor promoting, can follow up to promoting reactions. Some literature uh, brings out correlation between uh, the biotoxin microcystin from this algae I showed in the beginning and uh, primary liver cancer. Uh, other literature shows connection to degenerative nerve diseases like Alzheimer, Parkinson's, this comes from, from China. 
But what we know is also direct effects. For example, it works uh, as a skin irritant, this biotoxin, uh, for example, from the aerosols, because they are small cells and they can be in the atmosphere and uh, come to your skin and uh, make harmful effects. And of course, last of thing, which is not toxic, but it is uh, uh, not accepted, is an uh, unacceptable taste and uh, musty order inside of the water. So that means the customers of uh, the Waterworks will not accept it. Waterworks do a lot of things against this, for example, chlorination, but the very best way is to circumvent uh, these effects. All right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that is a little bit of uh, um, a picture of a lake yeah? and um, what happens in these lakes, you are from the rivers, um, already uh, Detlef says you, you get nutrients, phosphate and nitrate in the water, oxygen from the surface yeah? and dust from the surface and then you get also what's often happening, um, upwelling nutrients and oxygen, uh, and oxygen if, if the wind uh, uh, and the waves covers at the bottom of, of the lake and then you get uh, um, nutrients um, uh, re Re, um, back from the from the bottom of the sea, and um, what what's going in the food chain? The phytoplankton is, is the beginning. Then the zooplankton eat them, and the fish, and so on. And so the phytoplankton is a main factor in this uh, in this food chain for um, for all organisms. Um, about the monitoring and detection of the biomass, um, we have to um, uh, there are different methods. Um, one is um, uh, um, ACP microscope counting, a little sketch here, HPLC, it's a, it's a high pressure a liquid chromography and the flow cam, it's an automatic microscope. Yeah. Most of them are laboratory instruments or automated laboratory instruments, but um, you need uh, some manpower. The flow cam has very little tubes and so on and so on. But um, uh, um, algae, uh, as I sold, also a major problem in open water and you can really um, with fluorescence um, is the easiest way to measure this in situ and in vivo instruments. You see here um, our products, uh, lab analyzer, algae torch, algae online analyzer, fluoroprobe. And um, then the fluorescence is related to the bio uh, bio phytoplankton biomass, more or less. Yeah? But uh, you can get a good, uh, good, uh, um, good uh, relation between them. And the, uh, the best is, a, is fast and reproducible. Some um, examples, you have the water treatment plant in Buckingham. We are here in North, um, North America. There's a little lake, clear lake here on this, um, on this uh, north, uh, north of San Francisco. In this uh, clear lake, there's a little half island and there's a part, uh, Buckingham Park water district. This is an area where the measurement and um, where I um, um, made a lot of, of in, in measurements there. There's a water intake pipes, and after them, they make an oxidation with 12.5 sodium hydrocarbon chloride. They have to filter, pressure filter, sand and anthracite run parallel. All of this sand filter has to be back flashed um, uh, um, once um, every half a year, uh, I think. Uh, it depends on the algae bloom. Then they have a coagulant to sediment in the tank. and. Um, they have a monitoring with the BBE Fucola at different treatment steps. Yeah? And we work with them together um, already um, uh, since 2019. Here you see um, uh, uh, some uh, better version of a satellite determination of cyanobacteria. And um, you see here um, uh, over the year, the wind is going westerly. Then you, uh, the, all the um, algae um, goes to the western side, um, um, uh, eastern side of the, of the lake. And uh, sometimes it's easterly, but you only see the first uh, five to 10 centimeters in, in the water water, depending on the turbidity. And you also see only the, the surface. Yeah? And um, that is the main uh, situation that they also measure with our instrument. We have a case study with over two years. That is uh, uh, May in 2019 till more or less now. We have got um, every week uh, a measurement about um, about uh, uh, in this water body, and I want to thank Will Ray from Buckingham Water Work. He makes a weekly data set um, with our instrument, and we discussed about this data uh, um, a long time. If you see only this uh, this area here, then I can see uh, the different algae we can determine there, 
Um, we have the green algae, we have the diatoms, we have the uh, blue-green algae, a type of cyanobacteria, plantotrix rubescens, another type of cyanobacteria, unbound phycocyanin, and yellow substances that are the um, uh, parameters we measure um, beside the total chlorophyll. If you see that uh, uh, in, over the years again, you see an increase over the uh, uh, 2.5 years. I, I spoke with, uh, with this uh, uh, group uh, at this Clear Lake area, and it is really uh, uh, significant that they have really algae blooms in this, uh, in this, um, uh, uh, in this area from, from uh, uh, 2019, from 30, now to 150 is a big rise over the years, and that's very interesting. Then what, what uh, you also see that uh, um, diatom and green algae bloom in spring. That is typical, also that I've taught already a little bit. And you have this blue-green algae more in autumn. But if you are more focused on the, uh, on the, um, uh, on the um, cyanobacteria, you have here the blue-green algae, the um, plant plantothric sorbescens, and the unbound phycocyanin. You see the, the same tendency. Um, it's a very high increase of the cyanobacteria from here 9 up to uh, 40. That is uh, really uh, four times bigger what's going on there. And you have, um, that is a very, um, uh, uh, also, in, in, uh, during the period in between, you have um, cyanobacteria, and uh, in the past, there was all the time in the winter time um, no cyanobacteria at all. You see the uh, autumn cyanobacteria dominated, um, I already told you in the, in the other uh, picture, the, and you see also that the duration of the cyanobloot gets longer and longer. Yeah, that, that, that is not really, um, um, that uh, it's very um, um, small, situa a, a short situation, it gets longer and longer. Yeah. So, but uh, people uh, have, of, uh, uh, people know about these threats and uh, of course they, there are several methods uh, to deal with these uh, problems that they have inside of the water. And uh, one um, one way to to deal with is that uh, you could use a chemical treatment inside of the water. That means uh, uh, what uh, Toby already mentioned. You can use uh, hypochlorite. You can also use um, other uh, compounds like copper sulfate um, amounts with a high oxygen content, for example, to oxidize these. And uh, of course, uh, these are some ways very helpful, uh, but they have also disadvantages. And uh, one of these disadvantages, so we will come on later back to this, is what I show here in the picture or in the scheme, is if you um, use these chemicals, for example, they can penetrate to the cells, uh, they come into the mucilage and then they can uh, lead to uh, cell lysis. And with the cell lysis, uh, you make the problem potentially more severe. Which means that uh, with the cell lysis, you can also uh, release all the uh, other contents of the cell, including the biotoxins. So that means that even if you destroy the cells, you cannot omit the uh, effect of biotoxins inside of the water. Of course, there are trials to oxidize also these uh, biotoxins, but it is not always very helpful. Another point is uh, if you use this uh, treatment, uh, let's say it also together with ultrasound, which is another point uh, to deal with. It means that you can destroy them for a while, but uh, is it really effective over the time? Yeah. And uh, if you have uh, small ponds, it may be effective. If you have large water bodies, it's very difficult to use it. So, uh, imagine how much uh, of the copper sulfate or other chemical you need uh, to use it in a large water body. Another one which is also used here in Germany is a water circulation. The idea behind is that uh, if the uh, microalgae and the cyanobacteria are not so, so close to the surface, they cannot harvest the sunlight. But it's also a way that uh, it helps for a certain while and uh, it will come back. And so what we know here, even if uh, you ask a company to use some of these methods, 
then of course uh, they can help for a short time, but uh, usually this comes back later on. Skimming in another one, you know, or perhaps you remember that uh, during Olympic Games in 2008 in Beijing, they used this way with uh, with uh, with, uh, with um, lorries. They uh, uh, brought away all these uh, algae from the surface, but it's very costly and it's uh, also difficult. And uh, the other one, which is often used, for example, here also in Germany, to use a uh, the removal of the fertilizer to bind, the, for example, the phosphate. Uh, it can help, but uh, you have to know that uh, if you have, let's say, phosphate in the sediment, it will come back later on. So these are methods that are widely used, but uh, you can really say it is not, not very easy to deal with, because if you cannot uh, remove the problem, that means that you have a lower amount of phosphate and nitrate, then you cannot circumvent it. But the way, the best way is to check all the time if you have the comeback uh, of the cyanobacteria after your um, treatment method. Right. Um, I will you, um, show you some um, example also from this Buckingham Park. Um, 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 measurement uh, uh, you saw on this uh, uh, yearly um, uh, graphs only the raw water, but they measure the different treatment steps in this in this um, with this uh, instrument. And you see here um, uh, on the left hand side uh, the raw water um, in Buckingham, and then he measure he measures uh, the oxidated with uh, twelve point five sodium, sodium hypochlorite. They treat the, the water, and you they see that the cyanobacteria go up and also the unbound phycocyanin that means that um, they, oxi uh, the oxi uh, they oxidate the, the cyano cells and uh, release um, the un uh, unbound phycocyanin and that could be measured with this phyco um, uh, lab analyzer and you see that it is going on it's going up later on it is also uh, treated um, totally but the toxins could be free there was um, only sometimes they make more um, 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 uh, uh, um, toxin measurements uh, and with from, from Carola and they saw, saw a high value in Buckingham of mucosystein in this uh, in this water body. So that is uh, also important um, that you see. Yeah? Um, now another topic: um, uh, filtering. Um, we uh, we uh, I've been in per in, in Peru with uh, with um, uh, to to. Um, um, uh, install a fish, uh, the to a fish toximeter, but uh, here they also have a have a bento torch, and it was very interesting application they made. They are this wa drinking water basins here you see, and they measure the bent torch on the sand filters um, and see um, um, the value of the um, uh, bento algae in uh, in the water, and then they know if they have to remove the sand if they measure in the sand and uh, it gets too high the bentic algae on the on the on the on the sand, then they have to remove the, the sand and they measure um, also on the walls if they have to clean it um, uh, more proper or not. And that is a good um, uh, and so uh, good in, uh, interesting application in this um, with this instrument. Here some results. You see here the cyanobacteria, green algae and diatoms and total cell counts. And you see that on some places there are a lot of cyanobacteria and, um, and diatoms and some areas uh, are not that much um, and that is um, a very a very interesting um, uh, application yeah may i may i also mention something uh, um, that is often overseen uh, people think that uh, they only have to look for the algae content, uh, content in the open waters, but they oversee that a lot of uh, algae, microphytoplankton and cyanobacteria, they grow on sediments and they grow clear the clear the coast or, or in very shallow waters. And this is a high amount of biomass, which is quite often overseen. When people take a sample from the open water, bring it to the water, it is not the reality, but here from in Peru, you can see that they use it also to determine the algae contents on surfaces. And this is a an, an high amount of photosynthesis that takes place. 
And it is well known that uh, the cyanobacteria on these synth events, they can also uh, produce these biotoxins. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> so what what you what we know and what we are uh, hear from the people from the waterworks, uh, what uh, these biotoxins, this kind of bacteria, what they what is, what does it mean for them? Uh, why this is a threat? Well, it could pass filter elements, for example, sand filters. Yeah, these biotoxins, they are not very good soluble in water, but uh, in low amounts here in the PPB and the PPT range, they are soluble and they can come in and they can cause accidents and diseases. So you cannot see them directly. They are invisible and they are tateless and orderless. You have to bring them to a laboratory to determine the amount directly. They show a high toxicity and both uh, acute and chronic effects. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, if your dog uh, drinks something, uh, some of these waters, you can, uh, the dog can die in, in a few hours. Yeah, the detection needs uh, laboratory equipment if you want to determine it directly. That means that you have uh, uh, mass spectroscopy, for example, to use this. It can only be done in a laboratory. Other use um, uh, microscopy, but uh, this also uh, has to be used in the laboratory or with a field micro microscope. Uh, it's very laborious and uh, therefore no online biotoxin monitoring is available at now. And we think that it will take a lot of time. People try to find out something. And um, uh, of course, uh, there are countermeasurements, but these are really costly. And so therefore it's, it's a good way if we have an idea of what is inside in the water to monitor it directly and to get an indication what could be the threats of cyanobacteria in this water. All right. And we have uh, here an example, a uh, typical example. Uh, it's, it's more the problem, uh, for, let's say, for the reputation than the problem for the health. Uh, in 2014, water from this uh, um, Erie Lake, you see here the water tower here inside of the lake. Uh, they took up some water and brought it to the waterworks and uh, it entered the, the drinking water system. So the, the biotoxins came into the water supply and into the households. Unfortunately, the, the people know about this fact, but they did not uh, uh, use the opportunity to, to tell them. So it took two days until it was recognized that the biotoxin entered the water supply. Of course, immediately all bottled water was sold out, uh, but I think this was, there were two problems. One is uh, uh, with the press release that uh, people lost confidence into the waterworks. And the other one, it is the, um, let's say, uh, the risk, the health risk, this uh, water can enter this water supply system and could affect people's health. Right. Yeah, some pictures uh, to show what these organisms are and what these uh, toxins are. It, it's just a uh, short overview. We have here uh, the uh, formula of the microsystem that's most common. Uh, this is uh, the hepatotoxic compound, which I showed you in the beginning. We have this group of microsystems, more than 200 of different configurations of these molecules. And the typical way is the microcystis aeruginosa shown on the right side, toxic. And uh, we have other one here we have on the bottom, we have uh, oscillatoria or planktotrix. And we have uh, on the right side, so we got this right, this is anabena. They produce a very, very harmful toxin that's called also very fast death factor. It is uh, an alkaloid. Uh, it's really toxic, so if it's inside of the water, it has clearly to be avoided. So therefore, there are, uh, should be something done to detect these algae very early if it is in your water. All right. Um, <clears throat> I want to um, um, 
tell you something about the waterworks in, in Germany. We are here in the, in the bottom keel. There's um, uh, Babak, Detlef, and myself and our company uh, located. <clears throat> but the, uh, the situation, uh, the, the example is here in, uh, in uh, North, North Rhine Westphalia. There is a big reservoir, um, uh, drinking water reservoir, uh, um, operated from the um, Stadtwerk Resolingen. <clears throat> and um, that is very, uh, very interesting lake. And there was also the situation that left told already that there was a, it's also a recreation area. And there was a, a, a person with a dog and the dog died in a few hours. And he asked the waterworks, what's going on with your water? Oh, my dog was, uh, was uh, dying. Yeah? And then um, he saw that uh, this dog uh, diet, uh, that this was plantotrix rubescens. They make laboratory uh, analysis about that. And that is, this is a, a tower where the lake, um, where the waterworks goes in and uh, is a massive dam. And um, that is very, um, very interesting. Yeah, interesting area. They are also very nice, but they have um, this problem with this um, plantotrix rubescens. Then um, they, uh, uh, Make, uh, okay, we have to monitor this uh, plantotrix rubens and uh, rubescence, and they bought an algae online analyzer uh, at the waterworks in in Gülinda. and they here you see this um, algae online analyzer pH pH and turbidity I, um, uh, is here on this side. It's an online uh, um, um, analysis of of this water body. You see the the values here in this uh, uh, in this uh, in this graph here inside. It's 24-7 online detection with alarm levels um, of our, our algae classes. You can just say uh, if the algae, if the cyanobacteria are getting too big, uh, yes, you should make an alarm. And they have also a valve system here. It's here, here's a little pump, and then they have a valve system to measure di different treatment steps. They may measure, for example, raw water and uh, ultra-filtrated water uh, to see if the, the filtrate, um, the, the filters are um, uh, running good or if there are something happens. If you see the algae online versus cell counts, you see here the BBE plantotrix rubescence measurement um, over over the time, and they make also a laboratory test, and you see that uh, there's a good correspondence in that, but you also see there's a big uh, problems, too difficult uh, to, to uh, to count this filamentous um, algaes, yeah, and that's the reason uh, our also the algae online analyzer has a big, uh, big um, uh, uh, differences uh, during the measurements. Because if if there's a, a, a big uh, uh, filamentous uh, going through or a, a smaller one, so it, it, that is the reason that is not really um, a strict line. Um, the water works um, is often in the depths. Um, yeah, see the water intake um, often not on the surface, but it is in the depths. And the, uh, uh, the algae composition is strongly depth dependent. So um, if you if you only see the surface via satellites or so on, you do not know really what is going on in the, your intake area. That's the reason uh, they use also a fluoroprobes for depth profiling. If you make a, a, a fixed installation, you need a wiper. You can also add on and dissolved oxygen and um, multi-parameter dissolved co conductivity and pH available with this uh, with this fluoroprobe. Also a covert extraction, so you can really um, uh, measure um, so um, uh, laboratory um, um, uh, 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 samples in the laboratory, or you make depth profiling or long-time installation, and you get also the par beside parameter depth dependence. If you see the depth distribution of uh, plantotrix rubescent and total algae, you see here over uh, over two months uh, measurement um, of this fluoroprobe, and you see um, here the temperature um, uh, uh, dependence, and you see here the, um, the plantotrix rubescens um, are and the total chlorophyll are in the depths of 20 meters, and you see there um, during during the uh, during the year. It, um, the dependent depth, the depth dependence de um, changes, and at the end of the year, or if the bloom is collapsed, and you have um, nearly no plantotrix rubescence at all anymore. Um, that's more or less what we want to tell. Um, just some example of our fluorometers. You have this lab analyzer, and you have this algae guard. It's a flow-through instrument with a pump, 
and uh, IG online analyzer with a more functionality um, uh, to measure also different IG and have a lot of uh, different outputs available. The fluoroprobe, the IG torch, and we have this oxygen sensor and this dissolved oxygen um, conductivity and pH um, with this with this instrument here. Toby, Toby. Yeah. 